the High Line has become a popular attraction in a blossoming neighborhood in New York City. But has it become too popular for its own good? My name is Scott Gann, here with another video for the Bold Cities Project, highlighting innovations shaping our cities. Today, we'll be looking at how communities' efforts to revitalize a community can be really successful while also experiencing some growing pains. In Chelsea, a neighborhood in Manhattan, an old freight railway at street level was becoming a safety concern in the early 1900s. So in 1934, as part of the West Side Improvement, New York City decided to construct an elevated track for trains to travel through the urban landscape. This reduced interactions with people and other vehicles delivering goods, mostly food products, to the upper stories of refrigerated meat and dairy warehouses. Partially demolished in the 1960s, calls for demolition and plans for alternative uses of the remaining portion began to surface at the turn of the century. Mayor Giuliani even signed a demolition order in 2001. But everyone was surprised to find out that a wild garden with 210 different plant species had grown on the old infrastructure. So there was still a chance for the movement to preserve and repurpose this space for the public. The High Line as we know it today is the product of an idea competition led by the nonprofit called the Friends of the High Line. Founded by West Side residents Joshua David and Robert Hammond, Friends of the High Line gained the support of local residents, civic organizations, and business people, including the owners of art galleries in West Chelsea. With backing from Mayor Bloomberg and City Council, CSX donated the structure to the city for construction to start in 2006. The first leg opened in 2009, with extensions completed in 2014 to add up to a $187 million price tag. Another $60 million expansion is being planned for the near future. Now that we've got the history out of the way, let's ask the question, has the High Line been successful? Let's look at it from an environmental, social, and economic perspective. By many standards, the project has certainly been a success. Environmentally, the green space serves as a breath of fresh air for urbanites, as well as a home for wildlife. Sustainability was considered throughout the process, from life cycle costing to plant selection in an effort to decrease running costs and increase the positive impact of the vegetation. Socially, it became very popular very quickly. The park attracts around 8 million visitors every year. It is so admired that many other big cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, and London have explored plans for similar investments. Many different uses include passively enjoying the blend of city and nature, actively walking along the trail, enjoying food and beverages, park programming, and observing various art installations. Economically, who wouldn't want a 10 to 1 return on investment? Two billion dollars in new investments have flooded Chelsea since the High Line started construction. And development adjacent to the High Line is expected to contribute 900 million dollars to the city by about 2038 from new real estate taxes. Although not all of that can be directly attributed to the park, it has certainly been a catalyst. All of a sudden, those properties started to have worth and they started to flip and developers saw the potential and started to build. It seems like growth around the High Line will continue into the foreseeable future. On the flip side of the coin, social and economic problems surfaced that would have been difficult to predict. The original designers of the High Line only envisioned 300 to 400,000 visitors each year. So its rise to fame led to many more visitors than anticipated. For that reason, the quote, overwhelmingly white and non-local demographics of park users don't accurately reflect the surrounding neighborhood, according to a study by the City University of New York. There are mixed reviews from neighbors. Some are grateful for the High Line, while others feel like the park wasn't designed for them. Some in Chelsea express their discontent with the types of visitors the park attracts, putting up posters complaining about the touristification of their streets. Robert Hammond, 
co-founder and executive director of Friends of the Highline, admits, ultimately, we failed. Instead of asking what the design should look like, I wish we'd asked, what can we do for you? Because people have bigger problems than design. In response to public concerns with the park, the Friends of the Highline is providing programming more suited for the locals. This includes a youth leadership training program focused on local teens, musical performances, public engagement meetings, educational partnerships, and more. Liz Diller, one of the architects of the project, suggests that another solution to proactively meet the needs of the community could be for architects to have more involvement after completion. Post occupancy, there should be a role um, for architects to think about, you know, what their projects have wrought and um, to be able to manage the effect in some way. The economic concerns focus on gentrification. It's a loaded word, but it's generally defined as a change in character of a poor urban area due to an influx of outside wealth, typically displacing earlier residents. Although rent for the public housing in the area hasn't increased, there is a growing fear that as Chelsea becomes more expensive, renters, especially lower income renters, may be priced out and displaced. The numbers are a bit tricky to unpack, but the rate of growth has been rapid and unprecedented. According to different studies, like those from the New York City Economic Development Corporation and Street Easy, Property values around the High Line have been increasing by around 9 to 13 percent per year, compared to closer to 4 percent in the rest of Manhattan. One early sign of gentrification in the area has been the relative decline and closing of pre-existing small businesses and arts-slash-cultural industries as higher-end development has entered. So, what does the future hold? The High Line Network initiated by the Friends of the High Line, includes 37 projects around the U.S. making efforts supporting other infrastructure reuse projects. They want to share best practices as well as wisdom from the trials and tribulations the High Line and Chelsea have faced. I think it's really a good lesson for us, for all the people involved in the High Line, but also for all the other initiatives that are taking place all over the world, how to manage development in a responsible way. There's some good and bad from the High Line, but many are optimistic that the pros ultimately outweigh the cons. And decision makers everywhere are learning from this high profile example about how to design good places that benefit everyone. What do you think? Would you consider the High Line a successful project? Or do the project's problems overshadow its benefits? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this, and thanks for watching. This video took a lot more work and research than some of my typical videos, so if you're interested in learning more, because there was definitely a lot more on this topic, please check the links in the sources below. So if you want to check out some specific ones that I really enjoyed and thought provided good context, um, check out Dezine's interview with architect Liz Diller. Laura Bliss's City Lab article, and Jeremiah Moss's op-ed in the New York Times.